The People's Pharmacy Podcast is supported in part by Cocovia. Cocovia cocoflavanols support both cardiovascular health and cognitive function by promoting healthy blood flow. That transports oxygen and nutrients to vital organs and muscles, including your heart and brain. Cocovia now comes in an even more concentrated formula with 450 milligrams of cocoflavanols, five times more than the leading dark chocolate bar and 15 times more than the leading cocoa powder. Cocovia has a proprietary process that preserves cocoflavanols at the highest levels. The product undergoes rigorous testing at every stage to guarantee the highest level of cocoflavanols per serving and to provide the purest, highest quality product possible. People's Pharmacy listeners can now try Cocovia for 25% off by using the code PEOPLES25 at cocovia.com. Dot com. Have you ever heard of celiac disease or gluten sensitivity? Once considered rare, such conditions appear more common. This is The People's Pharmacy with Terry and Joe Graydon. Why is celiac disease on the rise? Are doctors simply becoming more aware of it? Or is there something in the environment putting people at higher risk? Getting an accurate diagnosis of celiac disease is critically important. Why shouldn't you stop eating gluten before your test? What are the consequences of undiagnosed celiac disease? Could this condition affect your brain, your bones, and your skin, as well as your digestive tract? Coming up on The People's Pharmacy, the latest update on celiac disease. In the People's Pharmacy Health Headlines, antibodies indicate past infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Between March and mid-May, researchers tested 16,000 blood samples in 10 different regions to see how many people showed antibodies to the coronavirus spike protein. The vast majority of Americans had not been exposed to the virus at that point and were still susceptible to it. For example, about 1% of the samples in the San Francisco Bay Area had antibodies, compared to nearly 7% of those from metropolitan New York. Although the prevalence of antibodies was low, it was considerably higher than the number of confirmed cases that had been reported. In places like New York City, San Francisco, and western Washington state, the prevalence of antibodies was 10 times higher than the number of reported cases. News from Sweden, however, suggests that people who have contracted and recovered from COVID-19 do seem to have immunity that lasts at least six months. Even people who don't have high levels of antibodies appear to have T-cell-mediated protection. According to the Swedish state epidemiologist, the risk of being reinfected and of transmitting the disease to other people is probably very close to zero. British doctors hope that a drug they're now testing will prove beneficial for COVID-19. The medication is an inhaled version of interferon beta, a compound that the body makes in reaction to viral infections. The pilot study was relatively small, involving only about 100 patients, but it was a double-blind trial. When interferon beta was administered by nebulizer, it reduced the likelihood that severely ill patients would require ventilators. They were also able to leave the hospital sooner. Larger, more thorough trials will be necessary to determine whether the initial positive results hold up. Another drug drawing attention is the corticosteroid dexamethasone. The recovery trial from the University of Oxford has confirmed preliminary findings that this drug saves lives when COVID patients are extremely ill. Over 2,000 patients received dexamethasone, while over 4,000 patients received usual care. The investigators conclude, in patients hospitalized with COVID-19, the use of dexamethasone resulted in lower 28-day mortality among those who were receiving either invasive mechanical ventilation or oxygen alone at randomization, but not among those receiving no respiratory support. Pre-diabetes has become far more common in recent decades. Currently, more than a third of both American and Chinese people fit this definition. 
People with this condition have fasting blood sugar levels that are elevated above 100 mg per deciliter, but not over 125 mg per deciliter. A recent meta-analysis of 129 studies indicates that people with prediabetes are more prone to cardiovascular complications and more likely to die prematurely. These studies covered approximately 10 million participants in Europe, North America, and Asia. Identifying and treating the metabolic disruption before people develop type 2 diabetes could have a big impact. The researchers conclude, screening and appropriate management of prediabetes might contribute to primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Prediabetes is an often undiagnosed condition that frequently leads to the development of type 2 diabetes. Intensive lifestyle changes or medications such as metformin may forestall frank diabetes. Now a study in the U.S. and in South Korea demonstrates that cinnamon might prevent prediabetes from becoming diabetes. The randomized controlled trial included 54 volunteers with prediabetes. They took three capsules a day with placebo or 500 milligrams of cinnamon. After three months, people taking cinnamon had lower blood sugar levels. People on placebo had no changes in their blood sugar levels. In addition, people in the cinnamon treatment group had lower measures of HbA1c at the end of the study. HbA1c is a measure of blood sugar over time. These promising results are not the first to suggest cinnamon might help people control their blood glucose. And that's the health news from the People's Pharmacy this week. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. In the 20th century, health professionals considered celiac disease to be one of those very rare conditions they would almost never see in the U.S. And in fact, they hardly ever diagnosed this autoimmune condition. Whether that was because it was actually really rare or because they didn't consider it as a possible diagnosis is an open question. Since the turn of the century, however, celiac disease has come to much more prominent attention, both among doctors and the public. Today, we're looking at the latest information on celiac disease. Our guest is Dr. Joseph Murray. He is a gastroenterologist who runs the Celiac Disease Program in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He is the gastroenterology section editor for the journal Mayo Clinic Proceedings and the author of Mayo Clinic Going Gluten-Free, Essential Guide to Managing Celiac Disease and Other Gluten-Related Conditions. Welcome back to the People's Pharmacy, Dr. Joseph Murray. We had such a great conversation with you last year. We're really looking forward to talking with you again. Well, I'm delighted to be back with you. Dr. Murray, if we were to stop someone on the street, say, 20, 25, 30 years ago and ask, have you ever heard of something called celiac disease? The chances are pretty good that there would be a puzzled look on their face because most people had never heard of it. So let's just pretend, even though I think now most people are familiar with celiac disease, let's pretend that they don't know very much. Could you tell us what it is, please? So... Celiac disease is a disease and it's a reaction to certain proteins in wheat, barley, and rye. And we use the term gluten to describe those proteins. And it causes a reaction that starts in the intestine where we start to break down and absorb those proteins. And the reaction is caused by the immune system. And in that reaction, it damages the lining to the intestine. It can have consequences like diarrhea, weight loss, bloating, gaseousness, but also can interfere with absorption of nutrients like iron, for example. So anemia is very common in this condition. But even beyond the gut, it can affect people in other areas. The skin, the nervous system, the bones um, can be affected by, uh, let's say, collateral damage from this initial reaction. I think a lot of your health professional colleagues were pretty clear that celiac disease affected the digestive tract, but 
we've learned over the years that, as you say, it can affect a lot of other things, like cause anemia and bruising. But we've also heard about things like headaches, migraines, even a skin rash. So perhaps you could give us a little more insight into all of the ways celiac disease can affect our bodies. Sure. So, so truly, celiac disease can be a systemic disease, in fact, affecting your entire system, not just the digestive system, but it can affect the bones. For example, osteoporosis can be affected, or osteomalacia, which is more of a softening of the bones due to vitamin D deficiency. You mentioned bruising. That's from failure to absorb vitamin K. Headaches and fatigue are some of the most common symptoms that occur in patients with celiac disease. They're non specific, but they occur in response to the inflammation. And indeed, if you take a treated patient who's been on a gluten-free diet for some time, they get exposed to gluten, often they will complain of headaches, fatigue, and even a, something called brain fog as one of the earliest symptoms that occurs when they're exposed to gluten. You mentioned the skin rash. An exceptionally itchy skin rash affects the points of the elbows, the fronts of the knees, sometimes the back or even the hairline, and extremely itchy, blistering condition. And that is another autoimmune consequence of celiac disease. I wonder if you could tell us about the diagnostic process. We sometimes hear from people who say it's a long and difficult road to get a diagnosis of celiac disease. Unfortunately, that still happens. Um, it starts with suspicion. Someone has to consider the possibility. Is it the doctor that thinks about it? Is it the patient that thinks about it? Is it a family member who mentions it to some? Somebody has to trigger the possibility of consider celiac disease. And then the, usually the first test that's done is what's called a blood. It's a type of blood test called an antibody test. And it's very important that that test be done on somebody before they change their diet. I know it's human nature. Somebody says, oh, I wonder if it could be gluten. I've heard of this condition, celiac disease. Maybe your symptoms are due to that, and the patient immediately stops eating gluten. The problem is that within a few weeks, the blood test that's used to detect and confirm celiacs may turn negative. And it's not unheard of for somebody to think about celiacs as a possibility, go gluten-free, feel better, go to their healthcare practitioner, ask them to check them for celiac disease, who does so. The test is negative. They go back eating gluten and they get sick again. And they said, what's going on? My test was negative, but it was false negative because they'd already been on the diet. But that's the first step is that first is suspicion. The de detection is with a blood test. And then if it's positive, usually then we recommend patients get a biopsy. That's done as an outpatient test, fairly routine test in GI. We put a scope down, take some samples from the part of the intestine that's most affected, and then they go to the lab and they confirm that the damage is present. And that still is necessary in the great majority of patients to do that. Why? Blood tests are not perfect. There can be false positives. And as I mentioned, there can be false negatives. And so it is important if we're going to make what is a lifelong diagnosis to make sure that it's a, a robust, secure diagnosis at the beginning. And I think we should reemphasize even though someone is thinking perhaps gluten is the problem, they don't want to stop eating gluten before they get their blood test. Absolutely. And I think 30, you mentioned 30 years ago, people weren't aware of celiac disease. Nobody ever thought about wheat or gluten as a problem. Now it's one of the first things that people think about as the problem. And there are many people even out in the general population who've gone on a gluten-free diet for varied reasons. I can't say that most of them are supported by science. But it's become much more fashionable to do it, but also people are much more aware of that as a intervention. Try a gluten-free diet, see if it makes you better. Dr. Murray... How common is celiac disease? So celiac disease, as far as we know, affects 1% of Caucasians. So 1 in 100 people who are of Caucasian origin, that means broadly European. Now, that's a, they could be Europeans who moved to South America. They could be Europeans who moved to North India. They could be – so Caucasian is a very broad umbrella. Um, but anybody who's Caucasian, it's about 1% to have it. It's less common in other ethnicities and races. It is it, – we used to think of it as more common in Irish people. I'm from Ireland. But that's really not that true. It's just as common in Scandinavians. In fact, more common in Scandinavians than in Irish, Irish people. 
So it can affect people of all ages, children and adults. Now, what if someone in your family has been diagnosed with celiac disease? Then what? Well, Joe, that's an excellent point because this runs in families. It, if we have one person in a family with celiac disease, there's a good chance we'll find a second person if we look. There are, I mean, obviously there are patients who are the only person in their family with this condition, but half of the time we find another person. And if you find a second person with it in a family, you're more likely to find a third person. And there are indeed, there are whole family kindreds where there may be a dozen people affected uh, with this condition. So that's one of the most important things. If somebody in the family has celiac disease and you're complaining of some some issues or something, then of course there should be, testing should be um, uh, performed in you. Doctors used to think this was a pediatric disease. Pediatricians knew about it, but doctors taking care of older people didn't really pay that much attention. Does that still hold up? That's now changed. Uh, I would say if you look back over the last 15 years, more people have been diagnosed in adulthood than in childhood. And I've seen people being diagnosed for the first time in their 70s, 80s, or even 90s uh, with celiac disease. And what's curious is why do they get it? They've been eating gluten their entire lives. Some of them may have had it for even decades, but others, I'm convinced, got it more recently. So it's a disease that can occur in childhood or it can occur in adulthood. Dr. Murray, there, there was just a study published recently suggesting that it, it's not just middle-aged people, but older people, like senior citizens, could be diagnosed with celiac disease. Presumably, they hadn't had symptoms for most of their life, or maybe they did have symptoms and nobody recognized them. Is it possible for an older person to catch this? Uh, the catch, of course, being in quotes, th this condition? So that, that's exactly true, is you can catch this at any age. And we used to think, I mean, that, oh, gosh, if you were diagnosed later in life, you must have had it for all those decades, and you just were, nobody thought about it. But we've some data, and there's some, some publications recently suggesting that even people who are tested negative in the future, maybe 10, 20 years later, could test positive. So you might not have it and then develop. Why would that happen in an adult? An adult who's presumably been eating gluten their entire lives. And it may be that something has changed in the immune system, that as we age, our immune system ages as well. In fact, we think of the immune system as aged or old after the age of 40. Um, now, most of us over the age of 40 don't think of 40 as old, but the immune system has entered a different phase after the age of 40. And as the immune system ages, certain things like autoimmune diseases may become more common. And it could be something like that that could be part of triggering. Now, in children, it's often thought to be things like uh, viral triggers, for example, perhaps taken together with a high gluten intake might be a risk for developing uh, celiac disease in childhood, but it may be something very different in the environment in adults. You're listening to Dr. Joseph Murray, a gastroenterologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He runs their Celiac Disease Research and Clinical Program. His book is Mayo Clinic Going Gluten-Free, Essential Guide to Managing Celiac Disease and Other Gluten-Related Conditions. After the break, you'll hear about some of the factors that might contribute to a celiac disease diagnosis later in life. How well does a gluten-free diet work to overcome celiac disease problems? We'll also find out how people with celiac disease are faring in the pandemic. What critical nutrients might fall short when someone has celiac disease? A well-balanced diet, even a gluten-free one, might not be enough. Some people with celiac disease need supplements. You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. The People's Pharmacy podcast is sponsored in part by Kaya Biotics. K-A-Y-A Biotics offers the first probiotics, which are both certified organic and hypoallergenic. 
All probiotics are produced in Germany under laboratory conditions with high-quality ingredients and under strict regulatory oversight. The three available formulas are created for very specific purposes, such as strengthening the immune system, fighting yeast infections, and helping with weight loss. To learn more about Kaya Biotics probiotics and the important topic of gut health, you can visit their website, kayabiotics.com. That's K-A-Y-A biotics.com. Use the discount code PEOPLE for $10 off your first purchase. Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Coco Via maker of high-potency cocoflavanol supplements that support cognitive and cardiovascular health. More information at cocovia.com. Also by Verizana, an analytical laboratory providing home health tests for hormones, gut health, and the microbiome. Online at V-E-R-I. S-A-N-A dot com. Today, we're talking about celiac disease. It isn't just a little kid's condition any longer. What might contribute to a diagnosis of celiac disease? Our guest is Dr. Joseph Murray, a gastroenterologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He's author of Mayo Clinic Going Gluten-Free, Essential Guide to Managing Celiac Disease and Other Gluten-Related Conditions. Dr. Murray, do we have any idea what might put the immune system awry, as it were? What starts celiac disease in an older person? All right. So, Terry, an excellent question. So we know to get celiac disease, you have to have a certain genetic type. But, of course, you're born with that. You have to eat gluten. But many people are eating gluten for decades before they develop celiac disease. And what we think is there must be some factor in the environment or factors in the environment that upset or, or, or throw off that immune system or immune balance in the intestine. It could be change in what we call our microbiome. Those are our, our natural ecology in our gut is very important for maintaining that immune balance. And perhaps something has thrown that off. The second thing is there are, you know, maybe there is some type of infection that occurs. And we did some work with the Department of Defense um, some years ago, suggesting that military service individuals were more likely to be diagnosed with celiac disease within a couple of years of a bacterial gastroenteritis. Now, that's a really big kick at the gut immune system. So it's possible things like that could occur. I've also seen things where people have been under tremendous stress, and we know that stress can affect your immune system as well. So things like that could be part of what um, perhaps throws the balance, the immune balance off. And if you've got a, a genetic predisposition, that perhaps that in the wrong context could then throw somebody into celiac disease. We spoke recently with Dr. Trisande about some research he and his colleagues did on environmental pollutants. Now, they were looking at young people, adolescents and young adults, but they found that those who had been heavily exposed to certain pollutants were much more likely to have a celiac diagnosis. Have you had a chance to examine that research? Oh, yes. This is very interesting work in children. And we know that the environment is a very broad thing and what our, what our immune system sees and is influenced by is very broad indeed. And you know, their, their work, very interesting work, has looked at these persistent chemicals that are not typically produced in nature, but have been used, produced industrially and applied to consumer goods and others. They get into the water supply. They get into our bodies. And there's certainly there's this association between celiac disease and certain of these these molecules. Now, what we don't know is we don't know if the association is causal. And making an association between something is really circumstantial. Causal requires a connection where you say the chemical is actually causing celiac disease. And that's a little bit for that takes more work to do that. There is also what's called reverse causality. That means somebody who has a damaged intestine because of celiac disease – 
may absorb more things from their food or they may have a different food intake, for example, from somebody else. And that may affect what is found in their system. Some years ago, we published a paper on heavy metal exposure and found that individuals who were on a gluten-free diet tended to have more heavy metals in their body. Luckily, nothing that was reached a threshold for, for great concern, you know, for toxicity, but enough to make, make us pay attention. And probably the key thing there was it was the, the fact that they were gluten-free and probably eating foods that tended to be higher in heavy metals that caused their levels to be higher, not the underlying celiac disease itself. But the, the work you mentioned is of terrific interest. We know some of these, these uh, chemicals present in our environment do affect biology and understanding how they could intersect and could they be part of what's playing a role in triggering celiac disease is a crucially important area. If people stop eating gluten as best they can, and that's not always so easy because it can sneak into packaged foods, it can end up in restaurant food, but but let's say someone is really, really good about avoiding gluten, you know, uh, wheat, barley, and rye, and, and all of the various permutations that those foods can come in, do they, do they basically overcome celiac disease? C can they have a normal life and not not experience some of the negative consequences? Okay, so that's an excellent point. So the goal, of course, right now, the only treatment for celiac disease is a gluten-free diet. 70% of people will heal their intestine and they largely control their symptoms on the diet. It's not without a burden. I mean, it's every day, every time you go out to eat, every time you travel, if you're, when, when we get to travel again, it's when you shop, all of these things impact your, your life. So there is a significant burden. There are the 30% of people either who do not heal their intestine completely or who continue to have symptoms. And that can be as often as once or twice a week. And that can be severe enough to take you out of commission so you can't work or you can't go to school. So it's not a completely done deal. And I think we've learned as gastroenterologists who care for people with celiac disease that just because we make the diagnosis, hopefully get them to an expert dietitian to guide them onto a gluten-free diet, this story is not over. It is an ongoing story and we need to follow them up. We need to support people to get better and then look out for the reasons why they may not get better. Dr. Murray, is there any chance we'll be able to cure, and that's in quotes, celiac disease with, without having to rely on this very stringent diet? I mean, what about a drug? What, what about some kind of other intervention? Well, spoken like a pharmacologist, I think um, <laughs> I, I think there, there are many attempts now to come up with approaches to help with the treatment of celiac disease. Now, some of them will be an adjunct or an aid to a gluten-free diet. They might be things that might digest or pre-digest some of the gluten, make the, you know, reduce the amount that's present, for example, or maybe reduce the impact of gluten on the gut. Now, those are not what I call a passport to eating gluten with impunity. They maybe it will be helpful, help help people who are getting exposed inadvertently, help some people reduce the burden of care, especially when they're traveling or could be exposed to low level gluten. But the bigger question is, is there something that really can restore the gut's tolerance? And there are several agents that are in development, some in clinical trials to try and do just that. Now, that's a tall order. I mean, it is a challenge. You're taking somebody's immune system that has learned to react to gluten. And a patient who has not seen gluten for 20 years, you give them gluten and they respond within two hours. That's a very strong memory. And so we are trying to overturn or suppress that memory. But I, I'm hopeful that because of how much we know about celiac disease and how much we understand about the mechanisms of it, that there's going to be, I, I think, good options in that in that realm. And there certainly are things that are in clinical trials to, to try and induce tolerance. And it won't just be important for celiac disease. If they work in celiac disease, those approaches might work for other autoimmune diseases as well. Such as? Well, you can take the allergy disease. We know there's already treatment, for example, for peanut allergy and pe approaches for treating peanut allergy. There are approaches for ragweed treatment with oral desensitization. But then there's the autoimmune diseases like we think of, say, type 1 diabetes. We know 
that when people first present, or even in the months before they present, they have markers for pre-diabetes. And sometimes, and this is type 1 diabetes, the immune type, and there have been now at least a decade of attempts to try and prevent it progressing to full-blown type 1 diabetes and the need, lifelong need for insulin. So that's potentially one. Another is rheumatoid arthritis. There's an autoimmune disease. We don't know what the trigger is, but maybe we could tame the immune system. Or other diseases that are immune-based where we know what the body is attacking, could we make the body tolerant again? So, so those are some of the areas that at least, I think celiac disease may end up being at the vanguard of those immune-based disease treatments. Dr. Murray, we're all very concerned, of course, about COVID-19. It has a wide range of manifestations, but it's clear it has an impact on the gastrointestinal tract. How do people with celiac disease experience COVID-19? Well, the first thing I think we have to, have to admit is we have no data as yet. There is a registry, an international celiac disease COVID-19 registry that we're hoping that, that practitioners from around the world will put information that's organized at, through Columbia University in New York. And the so really, it's based as much on anecdotal reports. Uh, of course, the people with celiac disease are going to be unfortunately going to be affected by COVID-19. One of the tricky things about it is, as you know, COVID-19 infection can sometimes first present with GI symptoms, diarrhea, abdominal pain, bloating, loss of appetite, similar symptoms to getting gluten. I tell my patients with celiac disease, if you get those symptoms, get tested for COVID-19. Get tested soon and if necessary, more than once. So, so that's the first thing. Be vigilant. Don't assume that it's gluten that's caused your symptoms. The second thing is we know patients with celiac disease tend to be a little defective in their ability to respond to vaccines. And that indicates that maybe their immune system isn't completely robust. They can, they're also more prone to pneumonias, especially older patients with celiac disease are more prone to pneumonia, which potentially could put them at risk for worse pneumonia in, in, if they were to get catch the coronavirus. And then we know that there is a, a predilection for certain viruses to become more active. For example, zoster, herpes zoster, which causes shingles, seems to be more common in patients with celiac disease. For all of those reasons, I tell my patients with celiac disease, you have to be careful. You have to be more careful than other people. You are maybe not at a higher risk like somebody, unfortunately, with diabetes or hypertension or someone over 65, but regard yourself at somewhat at risk and take all of the precautions, even suggested precautions, not just things that are mandated. Everyone should wear masks in, in, in indoor places all the time. There should be don't make unnecessary trips. Don't go into crowded shopping areas, for example, if you don't have to. Minimize your contact. All of these are the following the best advice that we've gotten, you know, from our experts in, in COVID-19 infections. Follow those advice, even if they're not mandated in your locality. Follow them to the letter of, of the advice. Here at the Mayo Clinic, where I work, Everybody on campus has to wear masks, and that's everybody, patients, visitors, and staff, and that's to keep everybody safe. And I do the same thing when I'm not on campus. When I'm out in public, I also wear a mask. Dr. Murray, there are so many potential problems associated with celiac disease. You, you alluded to them earlier, things like anemia, things like fatigue and headaches and heartburn and skin rash. There, there are even neurological complications like tingling of the hands and feet. You, you mentioned weakened bones, osteopenia, potentially osteoporosis, or dementia uh, as a possible risk. So it, it sounds to me as if when a gastroenterologist identifies a patient with celiac disease, it, it almost takes a team to manage this condition to make to make sure that people are getting enough nutrients and perhaps you could go into some detail about what kinds of nutrients are often missing when a person has celiac disease and how he or she should be managed. Okay, it's an excellent point. So obviously the pathway to get diagnosed can be through different ways. It comes to different specialties. Of course, see an endocrinologist for bone problems, they test you for celiac disease and then they send you on. So the management of a newly diagnosed patient in adulthood is we look very carefully for deficiencies, iron, B12, folic acid, vitamin D, zinc, and copper 
are the dominant ones, the ones I most commonly test. If someone has neurologic symptoms like numbness or tingling, I'll also measure vitamin B6. And so those are the ones I test up front. If they're deficient, I could just wait for them to recover perhaps over time, but I don't. I start them on supplementation. B12 deficiency occurs in about a quarter of adults with celiac disease. And in this circumstance, you correct the B12 deficiency, and usually they can then, once celiac disease heals, they can start absorbing the vitamins normally thereafter. There are other conditions that can cause vitamin B12 deficiency where it doesn't matter about the the underlying condition doesn't go away. They, they never recover their ability to recover B12, but they usually do in celiac disease. So we correct the deficiencies. The next, we check a bone density in adults to see where their bone density is because some start out really low. They may have actual osteoporosis already. If it's severe and it's in the osteoporotic range, I will usually ask one of our bone specialists to see the patient. And of course, they're going to get vitamin D, usually a higher dose of vitamin D as well as calcium. But some patients may, after six months or a year, may require something to protect or build their bones. And that's really in the realm of the endocrinologist. Patients who present with neurologic syndromes, and I think of three specific ones. There's the peripheral neuropathy, numbness and tingling in the feet and hands. We check for deficiencies. If they're not present, it usually will recover, but it can take as much as two years to do so. If it's a balance problem, a severe, we call it ataxia, some of those patients, unfortunately, don't recover completely. They will see a specialized neurologist to evaluate them for it, make sure there isn't anything else that could contribute to the ataxia. And then the third group are the people who have cognitive impairment. Now, you mentioned dementia. Thankfully, that's exceedingly rare, even in celiac disease. But if there's cognitive impairment, then I think a formal evaluation at that time is important. Some patients, you know, their you know, mild cognitive impairment, very mild, will recover when they're on a strict gluten-free diet. But others need to be carefully evaluated to see if they have something that's actually called mild cognitive impairment and to see if ongoing uh, management is necessary with a, an expert in that area. It is important to make sure that there aren't overlying mental health challenges, things like depression, anxiety, quite common in patients with celiac disease. And some of them will get better once the celiac disease is treated. But we do have to watch out for those patients. They're more vulnerable, for example. And we're now placing upon them the burden of a gluten-free diet, which can make life a little more burdensome. You know, this seems to suggest that nutrition is just really important. The ability to absorb all of the nutrients that you've mentioned can affect all kinds of systems. As you said, the bones, the brain, the psyche. I mean, you you know how well you feel in terms of your emotions, but but also your skin. So many parts of the body are dependent on those nutrients that we absorb. We hear all the time, oh, you don't need vitamins, you don't need nutrients, just eat a well-balanced diet. But obviously, for someone with celiac disease, that's not going to do the job. Yeah, that's not. Yeah, that's not. May not. May not do the job. Now, there are differences between adults and children. Interestingly, in young children, when we first diagnose them, we don't often see the deficiencies anymore that we used to. It may be that children haven't had the disease for long enough to get those deficiencies. Whereas with adults. They probably have had celiac disease for several years, and they have had the time to develop those deficiencies. So that's a little difference between the adults and the children. Dr. Joseph Murray, thank you so much for talking with us on The People's Pharmacy today. Oh, you're very welcome. You've been listening to Dr. Joseph Murray, a gastroenterologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He's the gastroenterology section editor for the journal Mayo Clinic Proceedings and the author of Mayo Clinic Going Gluten-Free, Essential Guide to Managing Celiac Disease and Other Gluten-Related Conditions. After the break, we'll turn to Dr. Leonardo Trasande to hear about his research linking environmental pollutants to celiac disease. Find out why he looked at persistent organic pollutants and forever chemicals and what he found. 
You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. This People's Pharmacy podcast is brought to you in part by Verisana.com. Verizona Lab offers home health tests that allow you to monitor your hormones and health conditions. You can take control of the quantitative assessment of your health and learn about male and female hormone balance, the stress hormone cortisol, leaky gut, gluten intolerance, or your gut microbiome. Take a more active role in tracking your health and take 20% off your first order of a mail-in testing opportunity with the discount code people. That's uppercase P-E-O-P-L-E. To learn more, go to verisana.com. That's V-E-R-I-S-A-N-A dot com. Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Kaya Biotics, probiotic products made in Germany from certified organic ingredients. K-A-Y-A Biotics.com. And by Cocovia, the maker of high-potency cocoflavanol supplements that support cognitive and cardiovascular health. More information at Cocovia.com. Today, our topic is celiac disease. In our discussion with Dr. Joseph Murray, we mentioned some recent research showing a link between environmental pollutants and the risk of celiac disease. Now we turn to one of the scientists who conducted that study. Our guest is Dr. Leonardo Tursandi. He's a professor in pediatrics and environmental medicine and population health at New York University. He's also director of the Division of Environmental Pediatrics and vice chair for research in the Department of Pediatrics at NYU School of Medicine. Dr. Trisandi is the author of Sicker, Fatter, Poorer, The Urgent Threat of Hormone-Disrupting Chemicals to Our Health and Future, and What We Can Do About It. Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy, Dr. Leonardo Trasande. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. What is celiac disease exactly, Dr. Trasande, and and what are the consequences? So celiac disease arises out of an immune and inflammatory reaction to gluten. Gluten is a protein found in barley, rye, and wheat in the protein. It's a protein. And when folks who are susceptible to developing celiac disease eat food containing gluten, over time, the body overreacts to the gluten and the immune cells create a reaction in the small intestine where the normally you absorb these nutrients into your body and the intestinal lining starts to break down. The main symptom is typically diarrhea, but it can also create bloating and abdominal cramping. And that will often lead you to go to the doctor. And eventually it requires a series of tests to identify because the symptoms are so nonspecific that one has to go through a battery of of examining the diet and other potential risk factors that may explain what's going on. There's some blood tests that are suggestive, an antibody battery of tests, and one also then ultimately needs to undergo an endoscopy and a biopsy to confirm the presence of that inflammation and the immune response that occurs with celiac disease. So as I understand it, for someone with celiac disease... Even a tiny bit of gluten can really be very damaging. Is that true? It can be seriously disabling. And there are other skin manifestations that can arise at the initial presentation. And there are other side effects like osteoporosis that can occur in patients with celiac disease. So it really can be a multi-system disease. So this isn't something that just goes away necessarily with a change in diet and shouldn't be dismissed lightly. 
So you're a pediatrician. Consequently, the patients that you see are are young and may not have experienced the full range of consequences that can occur. But I'm assuming that you're trying to prevent all of those terrible things happening in your patients as they grow older. And it's in the context of that rapid increase that we've started to wonder whether there are environmental triggers. Yes, there are genetic risk factors. There are well-characterized types of gene profiles that increase your risk, but that's not able to explain the entirety of celiac disease, let alone the increase that we've seen over the years. You can't really argue that diagnosis has substantially increased because the symptoms of celiac disease are really significant and require coming in to the healthcare provider. And that's what brings us to start to think about synthetic chemicals that are increasingly understood to disrupt the immune system. Well, that takes us to your research, which is quite extraordinary. And um, we'd love to have you explain exactly what you have discovered and why it has such profound ramifications, not just in this country, but around the world. So what we did was to bring in a, a series of patients who were being evaluated for abdominal pain. They were not known to have celiac disease. They all went through this battery of what we call serology tests or tests for their antibodies in the body that appear to be involved in that inflammation I was talking about earlier. And then ultimately, they all underwent biopsy to examine whether in the small intestine, this characteristic inflammation that you see with celiac disease was there. And so we were able to tease apart the patients who had celiac disease and those who didn't. And in all those patients, we collected serum to measure persistent organic pollutants. These are a potpourri of chemicals. They include pesticides as well as nonstick chemicals, these chemicals that are getting attention through the movie Dark Waters, perfluoroalkyl substances or forever chemicals. They're called PFAS. They're used to make pans nonstick, but they're also used in athletic wear for water and oil resistance. And we also looked at levels of flame retardants that are used in electronics and furniture. What did you find? Well, when we looked at the levels of these chemicals in those who were diagnosed in celiac disease and those who were not, we already found a remarkable signal with a pesticide that goes back to the 1960s, um, a metabolite a breakdown product in the body of DDT, a pesticide that was described by Rachel Carson in Silent Spring, was higher in the levels of children with celiac disease compared to those who weren't diagnosed ultimately with celiac disease. And then when we unraveled the data even further, we realized that these chemicals are hormone disruptors to boot and disrupt sex hormone functions. So because the hormone systems in our body talk to the immune system so carefully, we decided to look at the associations as they differed by sex as a biological variable in the mix. And what we found was that among girls with celiac disease, the nonstick chemicals were really strongly associated with the risk of having celiac disease. The flame retardants, remarkably, in the boys were associated with a greater risk of celiac disease. And that really speaks to the complexity of looking at these synthetic chemicals as they can not only directly impair immune function, but also scramble the endocrine system and scramble those signaling molecules that inform so many basic biological functions. 
Now, you have just told us about the research you have done showing that uh, these persistent organic pollutants, the nonstick chemicals, the um, surprisingly some of the leftovers from DDT, which hasn't been used in decades, and the flame retardants, all are associated with apparently a higher risk of celiac disease in young people. Is there a way for families to protect their children from these chemicals? Yes. The good news is that they're safe and simple steps to limit exposure to flame retardants and the perfluoroalkyl substances in particular. So from the perspective of flame retardants, the good news is there are already some steps in place to reduce exposure nationwide. The reason we have such high levels of flame retardants in our blood in Americans compared to every other country in the world is because California, yes, California, required the addition of flame retardants to furniture to prevent and slow the spread of fires in homes, mostly in the era of the tobacco uh, use in homes. Folks would sleep, fall asleep with cigarettes and bad things would happen. And the assumption was that these flame retardants would slow the spread of fires. Sadly, we found that that was actually not ever a reality. And we found that these flame retardants have a host of other effects, not just the celiac disease that we're talking about today, but effects in particular on brain development in young children. And so California changed the rule. Flame retardants are no longer required. And when you're shopping for a new piece of furniture, you can just look at the label and there's a report. Either it has flame retardants added or it doesn't. And most companies have done the right thing. And going forward, they only produce furniture without flame retardants. That doesn't mean you throw out your furniture. The elect these flame retardants are not sprayed directly onto the furniture. They're sprayed into the upholstery. But if it's torn or scratched or open, that's where you at least need to think about covering it up with cloth or putting a plastic covering on top. In addition, using a wet mop to sop up these persistent organic pollutant dusts that can accumulate in homes and opening up the air of the window to recirculate the fresh air can reduce the level of flame retardants and other persistent organic pollutants that accumulate in dust. And especially kids who are playing on the ground can, with their hand and mouth behavior, be especially at risk for that exposure. So to reduce exposure to the forever chemicals, simply uh, using stainless steel or cast iron cookware can substantially reduce the contact of your food with these forever chemicals. What about stain resistant chemicals? You know, I, I think a lot of people love the idea of having you know, stain resistant uh, sprayed on their tablecloth, for example, or or maybe on on their shirts or or on their carpets, and uh, water resistant chemicals on their hiking boots. Uh, are those chemicals a little worrisome? Yes, I sympathize with the idea and with the engineers who were trying to do the right thing and simplify people's lives, but. Those chemicals, the perfluoroalkyl substances, are so good at repelling oil and water. They're over, these materials are over-engineered in a way that really provides too much resistance and adds to human health risks, not to mention the potential for water contamination, for example, where you're washing your clothing. Um, after a long day or use, using the, the clothing period. Well, in fact, Dr. Jasande, I found a, on your Twitter feed that you had written, toxic forever chemicals are tainting roughly 19 million Americans drinking water. How is it not a 2020 issue? 
So how is it not a 2020 issue or 2021 or 2022? Well, the good news is in one state that's particularly affected, North Carolina, with water contamination from these chemicals, it really actually has hit all the way up such that the two North Carolina senators blocked the nomination of a scientist to the EPA who was extremely supportive of the use of these chemicals and the chemical industry. And the focus of concern that led to that block was the concern about perfluoroalkyl substances. That doesn't mean that it isn't a national issue. One of the reasons it's not as visible an issue is that it's not routinely measured in water, in municipal water supplies. And so if you don't know it's there, you don't know it's a problem. But in many ways, perfluoroalkyl substances are alongside lead as some of the emerging water contaminants. Um, it's like a thousand flints in a way. Well, Dr. Trasandi, these forever chemicals, of course, we'd like to get them out of our environment, but it's going to take a while. And in the meantime, we're living with celiac disease and an increase in risk based on your research. I guess I'm interested in how can we deal with the, the consequences of those chemicals now that so many people have celiac disease, uh, just remind our listeners what they need to do in the event that they get tested. And I take it that there's now a blood test as well as the um, the biopsy test that you mentioned. Uh, what What needs to be done once someone is diagnosed? Well, once someone is diagnosed, I would suggest focusing on changes in the diet to reduce gluten and eliminate it, period. I mean, the good news is, and we're seeing a lot of marketing supporting this phenomenon, but gluten-free food is prominently a component on the label of many foods in supermarkets these days. And that really is the main tool to treat celiac disease. Dr. Leonardo Trasandi, thank you so much for talking with us on The People's Pharmacy today. Thanks again. It was great being here. You've been listening to Dr. Leonardo Trasandi, professor in pediatrics, environmental medicine, and population health at New York University. He's also the director of the Division of Environmental Pediatrics and vice chair for research in the Department of Pediatrics at NYU School of Medicine. Dr. Trasande is the author of Sicker, Fatter, Poorer, The Urgent Threat of Hormone-Disrupting Chemicals to Our Health in Future and What We Can Do About It. There's a link to his research from our website. Lynn Siegel produced today's show. Al Wadarski engineered. Dave Graydon edits our interviews. The People's Pharmacy is produced at the studios of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. This week, the show was recorded in our home studio. The People's Pharmacy theme music is by B.J. Lederman. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Verizana, an analytical laboratory providing home health tests for hormones, gut health, and the microbiome. Online at V-E-R-I-S-A-N-A dot com. And by Cocovia, offering plant-based nutrients in the form of cocoa flavanols for brain and heart health. Online at Cocovia dot com. If you'd like to buy a CD of today's show or any other People's Pharmacy episode, you can call 800-732-2334. Today's show is number 1,221. The number again, 800-732-2334. 
or you can buy it online at peoplespharmacy.com. When you visit our site, you can share your thoughts about today's show. Uh, You could also subscribe to the podcast or sign up for our free online newsletter to get the latest news about COVID-19 and other important health stories. In Durham, North Carolina, I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next week. Thank you for listening to the People's Pharmacy Podcast. It's an honor and a pleasure to bring you our award-winning program week in and week out. But producing and distributing this show as a free podcast takes time and costs money. If you like what we do and you'd like to help us continue to produce high-quality, independent healthcare journalism, please consider chipping in. All you have to do is go to peoplespharmacy.com slash donate. Whether it's just one time or a monthly donation, you can be part of the team that makes this show possible. Thank you for your continued loyalty and support. We couldn't make our show without you.